Now that you know what the obsession is really about, what it is for, why an addict is enticed to go back to using, even when the cravings are gone most of the time, the solution is obvious. Meetings. I would like to interject here and say that I don't care how the tail end of the using ritual looked, like isolation and using by themselves. When the addict sobers up and returns to the real world, they will see people using mood-altering substances of all sorts, absolutely everywhere. The common bond, the common denominator, the common behavior of the herd is using. It's just how it is. Support groups and sober programs are the best avenue for taking care of the great obsession. But so many go to these meetings religiously and find that they don't work. Why? Before I get into why, I need to explain another route that many try and why it often doesn't work either. I'm just trying to save some people some struggle and time here, so I'm explaining everything. Focus, please. Many in early recovery resist joining and participating in sober program support groups, which is understandable. These groups aren't always full of people who are at the top of their game. So some might try just filtering their friends instead. Just get rid of the toxic ones, the bad ones. Maybe all the friends and family who use their drug of choice too much. Maybe even just sticking to normies. Here's the thing with that. Those who don't have a problem with drugs and alcohol usually still use drugs and alcohol. They still go to bars. They still go to drinking parties. They still have a drinker or smoke after work. And they still probably know someone who uses whichever drug the addict loved. They are still able to fully participate in a common herd behavior the addict should be staying away from. And I will explain exactly why in the next section. Okay, I just wanted to throw that in there. Back to why meetings often don't work. This is a big one that really shatters the dreams and hopes of early recoverees who are dealing with the frustrating belief that nothing is working to keep them sober, especially the ones who entered a sobriety program with enthusiasm and high hopes. After trying so hard and doing everything they're told, they still experience cravings despite all their efforts. They go to their meetings, do all the footwork with their sponsor, and they feel good while they're doing it. But then they go home and still experience the draw. The bottle keeps calling. The cravings are still there. After a few weeks or months of this, one can understandably arrive at the conclusion the program does not work. It's easy to silence Scaredy Cat's alarms with distractions temporarily. But once the distraction is over, Scaredy Cat is still there and he's not a happy camper. A relapse can occur, life goes sideways, and then the addict squeamishly crawls back to the only place they've found an inkling of salvation, the sober herd, usually after they had revisited the drinking herd for a little while. When they do get back to the sober herd, they are welcomed back with open arms and get to listen to the catchphrases like, it works if you work it, as if this poor soul didn't do everything that was asked to the best of their ability. That's rough. Now, I'm not saying people in early recovery don't have a tendency of doing some things half-assed, but let's take a minute to check out Maslow's hierarchy of psychological needs. This hierarchical pyramid has five levels. At the bottom, the first, most important, foundational level that the rest of the pyramid is built on is physiological. Beneath the label of the level, physiological, you may find a list. Oxygen, water, food, rest, regulation, elimination. Does that look familiar? The second level of the pyramid is safety. Third level is belonging. Up from that is esteem, then self-actualization, and each have a little descriptive list beneath their label. The premise of Maslow's theory is that a person cannot satisfy any level without first fully addressing the level below. One can attempt to satisfy any level but the effects of any progress will be short-lived without the solid foundation of the level beneath it. No level will stick without the level below it being locked in tight. Examples. Nobody gives a shekel about their safety level if they're starving to death. They will put themselves in harm's way to get food. Any attempts at esteem are short-lived if that person is being physically or psychologically abused. Safety. 
The drive to become one's best self, self-actualization, is thwarted when they have little esteem. See how that works? Now, which level do you think sobriety support groups fall into? Yes, love and belonging. Sobriety-focused support groups are fantastic for satisfying this level of Maslow's maze, the herd thing. It will also help satisfy other levels like esteem and spirituality, which can be placed in the self-actualization level, and maybe even a little of the safety category if the group members can support them in their escape from abuse. But which is the level that these support group meetings cannot satisfy? Ding, ding, ding. That's right. The survival essentials can only be fully satisfied by the person themselves. That's if they even know they're supposed to or how to do it. Brass tacks. The belonging to a group doesn't mean much after that person leaves the meeting if their survival brain thinks it's malnourished or not sleeping right, unable to excrete all the toxins fast enough, dehydrated, and blah, blah, blah. The survival brain needs the basic survival essentials fully satisfied in order to level up. Otherwise, it's all a temporary illusion. For as long as these physiological essentials remain unsatisfied, the alcoholic will experience cravings for their favorite drug or a bunch of other unhealthy vices that will compound the issue because, thus far, that's the only program it knows for getting the reward that would take the place of the real essentials. While these meetings may help the recovery feel good temporarily, they can ultimately end up being used like a medication to suppress reoccurring symptoms which are rooted in the levels below. And so the alcoholic continues to struggle with cravings and urges despite their participation in the program and not realizing how resilient they can truly be. This goes the same for any of the higher levels of the pyramid. The cravings will persistently beat down the door even if the addict is financially secure, has solid friendships, a satisfying job, health insurance, a great spouse, and everyone admires and respects them. None of it matters if they have not satisfied the essentials for survival in the proper way. The cravings will persist regardless of whatever's going on in the rest of the maze, and the sufferer will continually need to take all the things that give them a temporary feel-good fix, like a drug, more, more, more. The things used for the temporary feel-good effect may or may not be for their drug of choice, but whatever it is, it can throw them off balance, enough to eventually seek their desired effect. If we, as in us addicts, already feel well and good because we're taking care of basic health and our system is healing and running properly, there isn't much need for all the extra stuff that's often overused as a medication, a daily dosage. There's no need to keep attending meetings three times per week for the rest of our life because we are getting back to running a system in the fashion it was designed for and not abusing it, bogging it down, and keeping it wanting. I will say it one last time. Cravings are not for a drug. They are indicators for the lack of one or more essentials. <laughs>